evening, everybody, and thanks very much for coming along to listen to me this evening. Uh, these guys have asked me to talk about loads of stuff, and I'm going to have to do it quite quickly um, because there's a lot of stuff to go through. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the London Olympics. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about best practice in supply chain management, and then I'm going to talk about an initiative that I'm terribly excited about, uh, which is called the Supply Chain School. Um, as Cameron said, I, I do a whole range portfolio of things around sustainability. Uh, I won't bore you with all of them, but I'm really here today as a, a director and founder and part owner of a, a consultancy called Action Sustainability. Uh, that was a company that I started in 2006 uh, as a kind of a niche consultancy around sustainable supply chain management. Um, I'm also the environmental advisor to Transport for London. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the sustainability school in a moment. Um, the Green Sheets Fund is terribly interesting, but I haven't got time to talk about it right now. Um, <coughs> And then the other thing that I'll, I'd like to start with is up until March of 2013 and since uh, 2005, I was chair of something called the Commission for a Sustainable London 2012. And what that was was an independent, uh, the media used to call it a watchdog organisation, uh, to provide assurance over the sustainability of the London Olympics. Um, and in that role was quite high profile. I reported directly to the Mayor of London, the Secretary of State. We had our own independent reporting capability and all that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to start there, talk a little bit about the Olympics and reflect on some of the uh, sustainability lessons and then we'll see where it goes from there. So if there is one thing, one message that I would like you to take away this evening about London 2012, it was big! <laughs> if you imagine the biggest, big thing you can imagine, and here's our glorious mayor, Boris Johnson, um, in Seoul, Korea, trying to describe how big the London Olympics were, and he described it as like eating a hippopotamus. Now, this was slightly unfortunate, because in Korea, hippopotamuses, or hippopotami, are actually quite revered creatures and a protected species, and talking about eating one went down particularly badly. Um, but yeah, so a, a big project described in a variety of different ways. Now, not to be outdone by Cameron, uh, I'm going to show you a video as well. Uh, if I can. Somewhere. Oh, God. How do, I, how, do I, how do I do it? YouTube. Oh, go on. Can you? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Because uh, I'd just like to cast your minds back to a, a particularly important point in time in my career. It uh, may not have meant much to you guys, but it meant a lot to me, and it's only 65 seconds. So here we go. Goosebumps that video, it really does. It's absolutely awesome. Not very dignified, admittedly, but uh, <laughs> awesome. There we go. Um, right, let's see if we can make this, this work. Okay, um, so yes, cast your minds back to, uh, to July 2005, uh, and here's a very uh, very excited Kelly Holmes, one of our famous athletes, celebrating London being awarded the uh, the honour of staging the Olympics. And of course, you've had one in Sydney, Australia, anyway, in Sydney. Um, so you, you know what that's all about. At that time in 2005, the biggest construction project in Europe was this one, uh, Heathrow Terminal 5. And at that time, I was working for BAA. I was responsible for the carbon strategy uh, and for sustainability and procurement and construction. Uh, so to all intents and purposes, at an executive level, uh, I was responsible for the sustainable standards of, of this beastie. And <clears throat> what Terminal 5 did was some quite groundbreaking work, because if you're building a new airport terminal in an urban area, it was a very controversial project. You know, all of the NGOs were out to get us, you know, they really were. Um, <clears throat> so we pulled together a group called EAG, the Environmental Advisory Group, 
And that was a group of the great and the good, you know, the glitterati, the A-listers of, uh, of sustainability thinking. And they were brought together to advise, to challenge, and to, to really give us some idea around what sort of standards of sustainability should be set. And sure enough, the, the objectives were set. Um, and then the group was quietly disbanded and some of the objectives were achieved and some of them were brushed quietly under the carpet. Um, so I was determined when I started to get involved in the London Olympics and the, the very centre of the bid was all about we're going to deliver the greenest games ever. Um, that I was going to make sure, I wanted a body that could actually hold to account the delivery bodies for doing what they said they would do. Because on this project, although it did deliver some good sustainability objectives, God, they were allowed to get away with a lot of stuff. So you can imagine, uh, as we go forward to April 2008 then, um, we've got the Heathrow Terminal 5 is open. The biggest construction project in Europe is the £9.6 billion um, <coughs> Olympic Park in East London. So we've moved from one mega project to another, and I think kind of moved the sustainability agenda up quite significantly. So you can imagine how proud I felt when Mayor at the time, Ken Livingstone, announced my appointment as Chair of the Commission for a Sustainable London 2012. God, I was proud. I told everybody. No, actually, I didn't. I phoned my mother, and my mother told everybody. Um, and, and did I prepare for this role? I mugged up on everything. I knew all about combined heat and power, membrane bioreactors, social return on investment, you name it, I knew about it. So, what were the three questions that the great British public asked me most about the Olympics? Number one, can you get me any tickets? <laughs> yeah, preferably for the Brazilian women's beach volleyball. But, you know, I'm not a fast. And definitely not the Greco-Roman wrestling. No! I applied for loads of tickets and I got two tickets for the bloody trampolining. <laughs> Don't laugh, it was quite good. <laughs> Question number two. Is it really like the 2012 programme on the telly? Now, you might not get this, but you had the games, didn't you? When you had the Sydney games, it was like a spoof of the Olympics. They had something like that on the BBC. Uh, was reality like that? Oh my God, yes it was. It was really quite embarrassing. They had this one episode, because there was a whole load of controversy about cancelling the wind turbine. They were going to build a wind turbine on the park, and then, in my opinion, for very good reasons, decided not to. Um, but these buggers at the BBC, sent the whole thing up and they had this, this dappy PR character um, uh, is saying, you know, they were worried it wasn't windy enough and it wasn't going to go round. Said, well, can't you put an electric motor in it and make it look like it's going round during the game? You know. Did that conversation really take place? <laughs> yeah, actually it did. Yeah. Believe me, it did. So, uh, uh, right. And then question number three. What's it like working for Mayor Boris Johnson? Is he really as balmy as he appears on the television? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, he's also actually one of the most intelligent people I've ever met, I'd have to say, but he is completely bonkers. And um, my first encounter with Boris uh, when he was elected mayor in 2008, uh, I used to rock up and present to the Olympic board once a year, which is four people. The mayor, the secretary of state, Lord Coe, who's chairman of LOCOG, and Lord Moynihan, who's chairman of the British Olympic Association. So I, I go along and I, I present my report, and, um, and Boris is away in Boris land, he's staring at the ceiling, he's not really taking a blind bit of notice of what was being said. But then suddenly he sort of homes in and says, are we going to get electric cars? Right, okay, that was difficult in 2008 because the car deal hadn't been struck. Um, the way in which cars are actually procured for something like an Olympics is very different to the way you would normally procure. The deal is, how much will you pay us for the privilege of supplying 4,000 cars during the period of the Olympic Games for free in return for brand recognition like this? But in 2008 recession, the, the car companies were very uncertain and they didn't really want to know. So a deal hadn't been struck. So I explained that to him and he said, right, well, he said, you know, I'll ask you a question. Are we going to get electric cars? I said, well, I don't know at this moment in time. We've set an emissions limit for the fleet, but I can't tell you whether we're going to get electric cars. Right, well, I want a briefing. When the deal's done, I want a briefing. Yeah, OK. So anyway, eventually we ended up with a deal. Um, we did have some competition for the car deal. Uh, there were three competitors, but the two significant ones in this case were BMW and Nissan. And Nissan came in with a, an offer for cars, and they actually offered two thousand of the fleet of four thousand. They offered two thousand of their Nissan Leaf models. 
I have a problem with the plural of leaf. Is it leaves or leafs? I, I never can quite work that one out. But anyway, they offered 2,000 of them, whatever it was. Um, but then when they came along to do the presentation, it was like, well, you know, we asked some fairly basic questions like, where do we plug them in? Uh, and their answer was, well, it's your problem. You know, we're just supplying the cars. You know, you can work out where to plug them in. So you've got a 24-7, 4,000 car fleet operation, and you've got 2,000 of those cars need to be plugged into an electric power point for eight hours a day, and you haven't got the infrastructure to do it. It was just not practical to have that many electric cars. That and the fact that the LEAF at the time was not in production, it was only an idea, you know, it was in design. Um, so looking at it pragmatically, we said, okay, the maximum number of electric cars could probably be dealt with by the Olympics at the time would be 400, 10% of the fleet. And then if you evaluate the carbon emissions of Nissan's offer against BMW's offer, well, BMW's ordinary cars are significantly more efficient than Nissan's ordinary cars. So therefore, the best carbon footprint by a long way was BMW. BMW also offered the best commercial deal by a long way, and they won the deal. So I went along and I explained all of this to the mayor. And he was paying attention and listening to me. At least I thought he was. Because a couple of days later, on a Sunday morning, he's on one of these political programmes on a Sunday morning where you get the well-armed journalists, don't you, quizzing the mayor about all sorts of things. And, uh, and he got on to, well, yes, but what about, you know, um, what about the green credentials of the Olympics? You know, Mr Johnson, you've, uh, you know, Nissan offered all these wonderful, um, wonderful electric cars and you turned it down in favour of BMW. I thought, fantastic, this is my moment, right? This is my moment, this is my claim to fame. Boris, tell him. Tell him what I told you about a fortnight ago, yeah? about BMW and the carbon emissions and the fleet and all of those things. What did he do? He looked at the journalist with that sort of wounded puppy dog look that he has when people are beastly to him and, and went, yeah, but BMW gave us more dodge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Boris. Yeah, that really did me a lot of favours, didn't it? Yeah, so uh, absolutely as balmy as, uh, as a box of frogs. Um, so, can procurement help? Well, yes, of course it can. This is a statement from, uh, from Paul Dayton, the Chief Executive of, of LOCOG, the London Organising Committee. Uh, one of the most effective ways we found to deliver a sustainable games is to embed sustainability up front in the procurement process. You know, absolutely clearly signal to your market what it is you want, signal well in advance so they can compete around it and they can be prepared, um, and then don't compromise. You know, once you've actually set your standards, don't allow the market to, to bring you back from those standards. So, can something like that sort of position be good for your career, do you think? Um, yes, absolutely. Paul Dayton is now Lord Dayton, uh, and he's sorting out all sorts of mind-boggling commercial stuff for government. So, it did his career a lot of good, and then I end up here talking to you lot. So, I, <laughs> I probably got the best deal, didn't I, really? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so what have we learned seriously? Um, I, I was speaking to a few of you earlier during the, uh, uh, during the drinkies at the beginning. Um, the, the learning legacy is all up there on the website. The web address is here. One of the things I was very keen on... Uh, and really push the delivery bodies hard on was to say, look, there is no such thing as a, a sustainable Olympic Games. You can't use all of those resources to watch a few people running around and call it sustainable. That ain't sustainable, guys. You can only call it sustainable if you can make a difference in the wider context of society to sustainability. Part of that difference is all about sharing the lessons learned. So it's all there, it's free, there's loads of case studies, there's tools, there's academic papers, there's all sorts of things, not just about sustainability, but there's some really good sustainability content, both for the construction phase of the job, when the, uh, the 9.6 billion pounds worth of infrastructure was being created, and then also um, actually in staging the game. So I think there's some really good lessons learned. There's a paper about sustainable procurement that my team wrote, looking particularly at the construction phase and the relationship between sustainability and value, uh, where we found some evidence from, from London 2012 of, of those sorts of things. All of that has given rise to a way of thinking, to a strategic framework for sustainable procurement uh, that looks like this. And this is embedded in, has been embedded since 2010 in a British standard, BS 8901. Uh, sorry, 8903, what am I talking about? Uh, 8903, which we wrote, so I should bloody know the number of it, shouldn't I really? But anyway, um, we were actually the technical authors of the standard, and it takes you through a management process that you know really is quite obvious, but it's a logical path to follow. Sort out your fundamentals, understand what it is you're trying to achieve, 
get the enablers in place in your organization, the people, the processes, the training, the engagement with your suppliers, risk opportunity analysis, and then look at how you deal with your strategic procurement in a different way. And interestingly, um, yesterday I was with the guys at um, Sydney Water, and they're just moving to a much more category management procurement focus. They've got a new procurement director in. Um, and this actually fits that perfectly because the more strategically you can think about procurement and the earlier the procurement department or the procurement team get involved, then the more you can build sustainability objectives in in the way that we did for the Olympics. So I think this, um, this process gives you a kind of a logical flow through. And um, this is something that we work with NetBalance on this and NetBalance uses the same sort of strategic framework here in Australia um, and we think it works. So you start off for me with asking why. Why is it you think your organisation wants to be sustainable? Because I think if you don't have the why then it's very very difficult to get the what. The why will actually give you some priorities. So this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Now, I've got about half an hour's worth of slides about why, but I'm not going to bore you with them now. Um, but we've invented a little model that kind of helps you to think it through, that we like to facilitate with clients, to say, what is driving you to be sustainable? So, you know, in this particular example, this was a, uh, a contractor in the rail industry. Um, their biggest um, client is Network Rail, um, the national rail company in the UK. Okay. Interestingly, our biggest client is Network Rail as well. So all of a sudden, a lot of sustainability demands are coming down that supply chain to the contractors. So these guys are very, very heavily client-driven. You know, their clients are asking for it, therefore they must do it. They're very competition-driven because their competitors are doing it better than them and they're losing business as a result of it. So their drivers are very clear. Their priorities then are going to be the client's priorities. There's no doubt about that. Um, if you look over at um, this example, which is a, uh, a manufacturer in the oil and gas sector, they see themselves moving over time. This is we did the exercise now and the exercise in 10 years' time. They see themselves moving to be more mission and market driven. Now, why is that? At the moment, they make big bits of engineering kit that sit on the seabed to get oil and gas out of the ground. Um, they're the market leaders in the product. There are only four manufacturers of this product in the world, and they've got 50% of the market. They want to move into more marine-related renewable technology because they kind of see the light as far as oil and gas is concerned. <laughs> And because they have excellent technical skills, over time they actually want to start turning their company around. Therefore, if they're going to be in the position of delivering more sustainable products, they need to have a more sustainable business, a more responsible business. They need to have a more sustainable supply chain. Um, because like most manufacturers, ultimately they're assemblers and testers of parts. You know, they buy a lot of kit in, they bolt it together, they test it to make sure it works, they send it to the client. I'm sure it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's basically what they do. So what drives you will actually start to dictate what your priorities are. Um, so you can think about priorities in a whole range of different ways, but for me, asking that question why and having a structured process around why are we doing this is essential and then you can start to think about what sustainability impacts you're going for whether you really want to be best practice do you want to be leading edge bleeding edge or do you just want to be better than your competition or do you just want to be as good as your client is asking you to be all of those answers are perfectly legitimate i don't think you know we're not asking everybody to to be pioneers um, there, there are always going to be some early adopters and some followers. So once you've done that, then you can actually set out what it is you're asking your supply chain to do, usually in a document. And here's a bunch of examples of documents here. Um, and if I just run you one you know, very, very simple example from the Olympics, from the ODA, one of the things that the ODA set out was that they would start to deal with the whole subject of embodied carbon in the construction and they, de they develop a carbon footprint and for some of their products they look at trying to, to reduce the embodied carbon. For concrete, they went up to the concrete industry a year before they wanted to buy any concrete and they said, right guys, here's the deal. We want you to measure your carbon footprints. 25% of our bid evaluation score is going to be on carbon footprint. Off you go. So they gave them a year to go and work out how to do it, to go and innovate, to start to compete uh, around lower carbon concrete. What did they end up with? They ended up with concrete with 50, 50% less carbon 
than the concrete that was delivered for Heathrow Terminal 5, the previous project that I was involved in. And you know what? The most sustainable supplier was also the cheapest. Because they'd gone to the nth degree of working through how they can take energy out of the product, and then they worked out that it was going to save them money, so they could offer a more competitive price as well. So this is this, the, all of this sort of documentation is about signalling clearly what you want well in advance because if you give a supply chain a surprise, the price will go up. They'll go, oh my God, risk, difficult, don't understand this, you know, this is going to have to cost more. If you say, in a year's time, we're going to want this more sustainable stuff, they'll go, oh my God, what are our competition doing? We've got to be greener than them and we've still got to offer a better price. So you're creating competition in your supply chain rather than creating extra cost. For me, the whole notion that sustainability costs more is a myth. Sustainability does not cost more. Bad procurement costs more. That's what costs you money. Okay, so how do you go about it? Leadership. Great leadership is always a very good idea. Uh, these are the four kind of primary leaders on the, uh, on the London Olympics. Um, this is David Higgins, a good Australian, used to be chief executive of Lendlease over here. Now Sir David Higgins, he's been knighted. So he ends up getting knighted and I end up coming and talk to you. But anyway, there we go. Um, David was one of those really uncompromising guys. You know, he absolutely bought the whole idea of sustainability and would not accept excuses from contractors and certainly would not accept any proposition of extra cost. It's no, those are the standards. We set out our standards, you know, right at the beginning of the project. That's what you agreed to when you accepted the contract. Get on with it uh, and go and work out how to do it. You know, his, his whole philosophy was management make decisions and then technical people have to go and work out how to do it. Um, and it was a fantastic attitude to have for this project. Worked very well. Prioritise. Don't try and boil the ocean. We, we advise using a sort of a heat map like this that says, OK, I'm going to set out my sustainability objectives across the top here in different um, impacts of sustainability, energy, waste to landfill, social inclusion, whatever it is you think your priorities are driven by your why. Um, and then set down the side here all the things you buy, the categories of supply that your procurement people should be aware of. And then colour up the chart, you know, join up the dots, colour up the ones red that are really, really impactful and, and really high risk to you, and start doing them. It, it's don't try and do it all. I, I, I often see, you know, these bloody questionnaires that go out that ask suppliers about every aspect of sustainability you can possibly imagine, and then you end up with a load of stuff coming back. It's completely irrelevant information. You don't know what to do with it. Um, uh, this prioritised approach really gives you, I mean, as you can see from this heat map, there are very few reds. So my strategy for certain products is I'm just going to do the red ones. My strategy for supply chain for particular impacts, so what's your strategy for dealing with energy in your supply chain? The answer's the same, I'm going to do the red ones. Yeah, and I'm going to do something to leverage some benefit from that supply chain. Um, so that's priorities, training, people, job descriptions. You know, if you're asking people to deliver on sustainability objectives, is it in their job description? Is it in their personal development plan? Have they been trained? There are many, many ways of delivering training. We do a lot of face-to-face -face training. We're running a session here tomorrow for the water industry. Um, we're having a lot more success with e-learning, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, we have a lot of success with coaching. We're just having somebody available to rock up and help. Uh, or somebody that you can phone when you get a bit stuck. So uh, procurement professionals don't naturally gravitate to these types of ideas. So they do need help and you need to consider that. Measure. If you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. Here's an example of some measures from the Olympics. It's a very small snapshot of, uh, of some of the things that were measured that start to describe to you numerically what the outcomes are of what you've achieved. So it isn't about how many contracts have I got with sustainability clauses in for me. It's about how many tons of waste have you diverted from landfill then? You know, how many tons of carbon have you saved? How many more local people or people from deprived backgrounds have you employed as a result of what you're doing? Real outcome measures, very, very important. Finally then, um, engaging your supply chain. And this is, um, this is the project that I told you about earlier that I'm terribly excited about. Um, I, none of this will work unless you engage your supply chain in some way in delivering what you want. And what the construction industry in the UK found out, led by Skanska, but a number of other companies have come in now, is 
they have quite high sustainability ambitions now. As a result of the Olympics, a lot of construction contractors are outgreening each other, or they're trying to outgreen each other, and they see sustainability as real competitive advantage. Their problem is that in the construction industry, typically, about 80% of their revenue goes to their supply chain. And that's not untypical of most sectors. Most sectors have very large supply chains. So therefore, if Skanska want to be the most sustainable construction company in the world, which is their ambition, they need the most sustainable supply chain. And you know what? They ain't got it. They, they don't have the skills and competence to, to deliver on that at the moment. So we work with them to create something that we call the supply chain school um, to try and tackle that enormous problem. And do look at the website because it's fantastic. I love it. Um, and it's terribly exciting. So what we've done is we've pulled together a group of the, the great and the good construction contractors in the UK. Uh, there were six plus one supplier aggregate industries. Um, there are now 10 as we speak. I think there'll probably be 12 next week. Um, we'll pretty much have 80% of the, uh, the value of the UK construction industry participating in this whole thing. We collectively went to an organisation called Construction Skills, which is an industry-funded organisation uh, for funding for the initiative. <coughs> so, how does it work? It's a virtual learning environment. Um, the, the big contractors at the top say to their subcontractors, we want to get you involved in this. Um, you go and log on, you tell us who you are, what you do, who you work for. Um, the system goes away because you remember that heat map with the red, amber, green that I showed you just now. You, you were paying attention. But it's okay, you can nod, it's all right. You know, I, I know it's you know, 20 minutes since you had a glass of wine, but still. Um, so it's got one of those heat maps embedded into the software. So if I'm a demolition contractor and I go on the system and I log on and I go demolition contractor, um, then the system knows what the sustainability priorities are. So you're a demolition contractor, you need to know about waste, you know, water management, biodiversity, whatever it is. You then do a self-assessment. It asks you some questions in a bit more detail about those subjects only. It doesn't ask you about things that you don't need to know. Um, you do your self-assessment, the system goes away and it produces an action plan for you. So you, and as you can see, it's all very iPad friendly and uh, it's a mobile device thing. Um, then it comes up with an action plan that looks like this. So it draws from 500 odd resources on the system and it gives you 10 things to do that can pop up on your smartphone or whatever. Go away and do these 10 things. There might be some e-learning, there might be events to attend, it might just simply be reading a policy or joining a group or getting involved in an initiative. The great thing about it is we can continue to add to this, it could be anything that you want it to be. Once you've done your 10 actions, then you go back and do a reassessment and the system will give you another 10 actions. So it's very mobile, it's very user friendly, it's for the iPad generation, uh, it enables subcontractors to learn at their own speed, it enables us to track the whole thing so we can understand where these people are going. Um, the, one of the tricks is to make sure that really high quality resources are available on the system. Uh, that's the responsibility of my team to make sure that it's updated every month, that there isn't anything out of date, that we've really got the latest thinking in there so people are really kept up to speed and, and kept competitive around the thing. Um, as I said, we've had a great deal of success with e-learning. Uh, you can go on this, by the way, and log on. It's, it's open access because it's funded by an industry group. Um, you don't have to pay. Uh, so you can go on and give it a try. And, and interestingly, I mean, partly because we work with Net Balance and we're trying to get one of these schools off the ground here in Australia, um, I think our website has been viewed in something like 102 countries. Uh, but after the UK, the most views are actually from Australia. So, um, so do take a look so you can kind of get into the detail and see what, uh, what some of the e-learning can do for you. Um, you can't have an app for everything, can you? So there is still face-to-face. -face. You know, We do have events. We have supplier events. We have face-to-face -face training. Um, we have collaborative workshops where the more advanced practitioners in particular areas actually work together to kick on and, uh, and move towards best practice. So the principles, it's, it's voluntary. It's a carrot, not a stick. It's very much supplier driven. They can do it at their own pace. It's very much based on trust. They work with us. We don't reveal um, all the details of how incompetent they think they are to their, uh, uh, to their clients. Um, we launched in June last year. We have over 2,000 members uh, already participating in the school. Uh, you can see all the numbers there. I won't bore you with them. Um, 
primarily small businesses, interestingly, so the, the spread is naturally gravitating towards small businesses because that is the nature of the construction industry in the UK. It's a, you know, uh, it's a Tower of Babel of Bob the Bloody Builders, you know, and uh, that's how it is. And, and reaching them is really, really difficult. So the school manages to do that. Um, here are the various categories of supply that we deal with. Again, I won't bore you with that, but as you can see, we're covering just about everything. So every aspect of the construction industry, there is somebody somewhere getting involved in the school and learning about sustainability. These are the 36 um, construction companies in the UK that have a turnover of more than 100 million. Uh, and as you can see, even if they're not partners in the school, their supply chains are still involved because there's a lot of common suppliers across the construction industry. So we can start to demonstrate that we really are influencing the whole of the industry. Um, people are saying great things about us. This Jonathan Porritt and Peter Head saying how wonderful the supply chain school is. Um, we're getting a lot of good press. So there's a lot of good media coverage coming out of it. Uh, the contractors are getting very excited about that because they feel that sort of exposure makes them more competitive. Um, the great benefit for members, it's free! It doesn't cost them anything. It's being paid for by construction skills. When the construction skills money runs out, we'll be asking the partners at the top end of the supply chain to pay for it. Uh, it will continue to be free at the point of use to, to members. It's very flexible. It's for the iPad generation. You can, you know, you can learn sitting at the station. You can, uh, you can learn anywhere. In fact, if I was in the UK at this point, I'd say you can learn sitting on the toilet. But I'm sure here in Australia, you're far more sophisticated than that. So, um, so you can learn absolutely anywhere. What's in it for the partners? Well, it addresses a problem that they've never been able to solve. You know, how do they actually reach out to this enormous supply chain uh, to deliver on, on sustainability? So they can use their partnership status to help them to win work. Um, I think the other thing is, I mean, there's a picture of them all there looking terribly jolly. That's probably because they've been out on the beer. Um, we ran a number of supplier events. We ran 10 supplier events in 12 months. So traditionally competing um, people were kind of getting together and rocking up and having a few beers in the hotel room after the event. And they, they really have kind of banded together now as a group uh, and are really working very well together. So there's some great benefits to be had for the, the partners. Um, going forward, we see this as a global initiative. Uh, we are working with that balance where I think very close to getting one of these off the ground. Here in Australia, it's very similar. A lot of the material is the same. Um, you know, we, we need to Aussieize some of it and we need to find some, um, some partners to actually contribute financially to making it happen. Um, but we think we can make it happen here. We think we can apply the principle in other sectors as well. It's not just construction, although construction is the biggest and the most impactful, which is why we started where we did. So we see a great future for this, uh, for this concept. But that just about wraps it up for me. If you do want to know any more, um, there's books you can buy that we've written. There's videos that you can log on and get for free. Um, you can do a diagnostic thing on the website, or you can even go on the Supply Chain School and get the app. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening to me.